AP Biology, Chapter 41, Animal Nutrition, Part 1. Today we're going to learn why animals eat. Nutritional requirements. Remember that animals are heterotrophs. They cannot make their own food. Hetero means other, troph means feeder. They need to take in food from another source. Now, when I say that animals can't make their own food, we're not talking about making your cornflakes in the morning. Uh, you didn't make those organic molecules in the cornflakes. You're just preparing it to make it more delicious. Now, there's three needs that animals need to fill by, um, by eating. A car needs gasoline, otherwise it doesn't go anywhere, and animals need fuel as well. That fuel uh, that drives a lot of the processes that go inside the, the animal are, is ATP. And that ATP is made by cell respiration, and we need to make that ATP from cell respiration from the chemical energy found in food, the stored energy, chemical potential energy, between the atoms of different things within molecules. We also need raw materials. You're, you know, over 100 pounds, and those, the matter of you came from somewhere, and all the organic molecules, the carbon-based molecules in your body had to come from somewhere, and they came from the foods you ate. And we need some essential nutrients. These are not the raw materials for building up large parts of our body, the carbon source. We're talking about things that uh, animals need in uh, smaller quantities in carbon in order to um, make some of the things they need to make. Let's go ahead and write down the three reasons why animals need to um, eat fuel, chemical energy to do cell work, raw materials, carbon source, and essential nutrients. These we're going to focus on things like um, vitamins and minerals. All right, here's another way of looking at this. We have food intake, you know, you eat some food. Then you make some ATP by cell respiration. Basal metabolism is also called resting metabolism. And even if you were in a coma, you need about 1,000 calories a day just to survive. So that um, is the ATP you use just to kind of keep your body alive. Now, of course, if you have other things going on, if you're being chased by wolves or, you know, you're active in any way, uh, you're going to need more energy, more ATP. So that has to come from food. And also temperature regulation. Remember, birds and mammals are warm-blooded. So we burn off extra energy in order to create heat. Remember, that is a byproduct of breaking down uh, anything, really, uh, or having anything going through a chemical reaction. We're going to have heat as a waste product. And that waste product is actually good for us because that allows us to uh, maintain a stable body temperature that allows our chemical reactions to go faster than animals that can't do that. Then we have biosynthesis, bio, life, synthesis, put together, putting together life's molecules. Of course, you came from a single cell, and uh, it required quite a bit of stuff that you had to eat in order to make all the stuff in your body that you uh, consist of today. And of course, reproduction, um, especially when you're pregnant, you're building another person, and that requires food. You literally are eating for uh, two uh, when you're pregnant. And then storage, uh, any extra energy left over after your ATP production uh, needs are met, as well as biosynthesis, is just stored. Now, remember, glycogen is a chain of glucose stored in the muscles and liver as a ready supply of energy. And then we have fat, which is a long-term storage. And um, you can't break it down very quickly. However, it does provide twice as much energy as carbohydrates like glycogen. energy budget. You can kind of think of uh, food energy coming into and out of an organism as a budget, uh, kind of like a bank account. So if you have extra money, you might save that money in a savings account or maybe invest in stocks. If you're short money, you might need to borrow some money and uh, to pay your bills. And you can kind of think of energy in the same way. If we have any excess energy, we use it for uh, making stuff, you know, tissue and storage. So that uh, is stored as fat. This little guy has a lot of uh, extra storage of energy within him. Now, there is some genetic uh, predispositions to regulating appetite, and they're discovering more and more about this as we go, th you know, as scientists learn more about it. However, here, the obese mouse has a defect in a gene which doesn't suppress the uh, appetite, so this mouse just keeps on eating. All right, this is a review of Chapter 5. And uh, we're talking energy storage in humans is uh, in the liver and muscle cells, and this is a review, stored as glycogen. Remember, this is also called animal starch, and it's very similar to uh, plant starch. Plant starch, also called amylose, is just a chain of glucose, and it's not very highly branched. Glycogen also is a chain of glucose. It's a polymer of glucose monomers, 
However, it's more highly branched, and each one of these little circles represents a glucose molecule. If glycogen stores are full, if you've stored a lot of glycogen in your liver and muscles, then you store the extra as fat. And if you're wondering how you turn sugar into fat, well, it's all carbons, hydrogens, and uh, you rip off a few oxygens, reassemble things with enzymes, and bam, you got yourself some fat, which is a triglyceride, if you remember. Three fatty acid tails attached to a glycerol uh, side chain. All right, managing caloric intake. When fewer calories are taken in than expended, the fuel is taken out of storage and uh, oxidized. So as you need more energy, you break down the glycogen from your liver and your muscle cells to provide sugar in your uh, bloodstream that will provide the um, raw materials for cell respiration in order to make ATP. So as you're running, you're going to need to make more ATP to twitch those muscles. You'll learn about the role of uh, ATP and muscles um, in a future class. However, you're going to need that energy in order to do any kind of long distance running or biking or any kind of uh, extended exercise. And then after you get done with your glycogen, which you have available, you metabolize your fat and break that down next. All right, homeostasis. Homeostasis, once again, is maintaining a stable internal environment. This is a type of uh, this is a theme in biology called regulation. Remember, we have two types of regulation. We have positive feedback where you increase an effect and then we have negative fe feedback where you reverse an effect as a result of producing something. So you try to decide what this is. Is this negative feedback or positive feedback? Are we increasing a trend or reversing a trend? All right, so here we have the um, uh, blood glucose, 90 milligrams, and let's say that we eat some uh, food, a bag of M&Ms. Now your blood glucose levels are gonna rise after you digest it. And as a response, your pancreas is going to release insulin. Insulin is going to target the liver and the cells of your body. As a result of insulin uh, opening up protein channels, we're going to have glucose enter the liver and stored as glycogen, lowering our blood sugar. And then we're going to have insulin opening up protein channels in our cells in order for the cells to take up sugar so they can do cell respiration. So that's going to lower our blood sugar to maintain sugar homeostasis. Remember, we're reversing a trend. Sugar levels are going up. This is lowering the blood sugar by taking the sugar out of the blood. So that's called negative feedback. Over here, we have blood uh, sugar dropping. Let's say we're exercising. And as a result of that exercise and the blood sugar dropping, the pancreas is going to release a different hormone called glucagon. Now, glucagon works antagonistically or opposite of insulin. What, uh, and so that's one way to remember it, by the way. If you remember that insulin lowers blood sugar, you know that glucagon does the opposite, which you can guess is going to raise blood sugar. So glucagon targets the liver, which has the glycogen stored. The glycogen um, is broken down into sugars. Sugars enter the blood, and then the blood sugar goes up. So blood sugar was dropping. We're reversing the trend, and now homeostasis of sugar is maintained within the blood. That's also negative feedback. Anytime you're reversing a trend, that's negative feedback. If by the blood sugar dropping, we lowered the blood sugar, sugar even more, that would be positive feedback, which doesn't occur. All right, here's the written version of this, and we're going to want to write this down. Human body regulates the use of uh, glucose, which is a major cellular fuel. The body can use other fuels too, but glucose is the primary one. Insulin reduces blood glucose levels. Make sure you have that in your notes. When glucose levels rise above a set point, the pancreas secretes insulin. The pancreas has several roles, and this is one of them. It promotes the transport of glucose into cells and stores glycogen in liver and muscle. And then we drop our blood glucose levels. That's important. Glucagon is the opposite of insulin, and you have to know both. Glucagon increases blood glucose levels. When you have low blood sugar, when glucose drops too low, you secrete glucagon from your pancreas, and then this um, glucagon is going to promote the breakdown of glycogen, release the glucose into the blood, and you're going to increase blood glucose levels. So whenever you're exercising, you can kind of think that. You're going to be secreting some glucagon, so you get more sugars. And you can imagine there's only so much glycogen in your liver and your muscles. So once you run out of that, if you're exercising, you're not going any further. All right, take a few seconds to review this. All right, nutritional requirements. Fuel for ATP production. 
So if you remember, we need nitrogen for our proteins, that NCC backbone of the amino acids, NCC. Uh, then we have that middle carbon, which has the functional groups coming off of it. So we have to get some nitrogen and phosphorus. Remember that phospholipid bilayer made of uh, phosphate and two fatty acid tails on those phospholipids. Got to have some phosphorus for that. Also, the sugar and phosphate backbone of, ni of uh, DNA is uh, important as well. Without phosphorus, you can't make the backbones of DNA, which you kind of need. Also, we need some complex molecules animals cannot synthesize, like amino acids. There are some amino acids that we can't make and some vitamins that we can't make. And we need some minerals for things like our hemoglobin. We need iron for that to fold properly, calcium, etc. So we should write this down. Here we have a uh, giraffe. Many herbivores have diets deficient in mineral salts. They might find other sources like salt licks and chewing on bones. That would freak me out if I saw that in an Af uh, you know, an Africa savanna where uh, an animal's eating the bones of another animal, like a giraffe eating a lion bone. That'd be kind of odd. But, you know, they're just trying to get their calcium, and that's the survival advantage of that. All right, vegetarian diets. Now, you might have heard of uh, some problems with being a vegetarian, and we're going to talk about the, the major problem now. There are eight essential amino acids, which means that there's eight amino acids you can't get, uh, you can't make with your own enzymes and your own DNA. Your DNA doesn't code for any enzymes to make these uh, amino acids. So where do you get these amino acids? And the answer is uh, your diet. The other 12 amino acids you can make uh, just from carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, whatever else. No, not phosphorus, but uh, the other stuff that you get from your body. Possible amino acid deficiency can uh, be avoided by eating foods with complementary amino acids. So beans have these um, amino acids, valine, threonine, phenylalanine, and you might be starting to get familiar with these names after doing that DNA stuff where you had to do transcription and translation. Over here we have a, a grain, wheat and corn are grains, and these uh, amino acids are found in these grains. So if you eat corn with beans, you get all your amino acids if you're a vegetarian. I was thinking if I was a vegetarian, what I would do is get some uh, corn chips and bean dip because I like both those, and that would take care of all my amino acid needs. Now one other side note is that you do have to eat the grains with the beans at the same time uh, because when you put together your proteins you need to have all those amino acids to um, be chained together at the ribosome at the same time and if you don't have all the amino acids available when you make your proteins then you can't make the protein. You can't make a protein with a missing amino acid so that's the reason why you have to eat them at the same time. This ends part one of your notes on chapter 41 animal nutrition.